Hey everybody. Been hanging out here for a couple of months watching the world turn. Seeing everything going on. There's plenty to talk about. We're going to start this off by our Pharaoh King Trader in Chief. Just another example of how he shows his partiality and his his real allegiance. Islam. I said it before, I'll say it again. I've done enough study about it. I'm not a scholar on it, but I do have common sense and eyeballs, and I understand history. Islam is peaceful when they dominate every other culture and religion. When you abide by only Islam, and everybody is Islamic, then you have peace. Until that is acquired, it is the politics within the religion of jihad against everything else that is not Islam. You cannot have a peaceful religion when it calls to jihad and either kill the infidel because they will not become a member of Islam. So there is it in a nutshell. It is an ancient struggle of good against evil. Islam is the favored religion of the devil. It is just a modern time word for Satanism. There are many others, but this is the most prolific religion. A caliphate wishing to be reborn to dominate all of the world. You're seeing what's going on in Europe and you're hearing about it. So get wise to the rise and open your eyes. And don't let it be a surprise. And our illustrious Obama is going to make his first visit to a U.S. mosque. Like that is something that he hasn't done before, huh? First time over here in the old homeland. There's that word again, tolerance. Tolerance, allowance, religious tolerance. We must tolerate it. We must tolerate the jihad that it calls for. He knows what it calls for. Remember he said how the call to prayer was one of the sweetest things that he could ever remember hearing in the morning when he was over there on the other side of the world living? He is going to visit the Islamic Society of Baltimore. Oh, it is one of the Mid-Atlantic region's largest Muslim centers, and its description of itself is aspiring to be the anchor, the, the big stud hub of a growing Muslim community with diverse backgrounds, democratically governed, oh boy, relating to one another with inclusiveness and tolerance, interacting with the neighbors in an Islamic exemplary manner. He is going to make the visit to celebrate the contributions Muslim Americans make to our nation and reaffirm the importance of religious freedom to our way of life. The president believes that one of our nation's greatest strengths is our rich diversity and the very idea that Americans of different faiths and backgrounds can thrive together, that we're all part of the same American family. Muslim Americans are our friends and neighbors, co-workers, sports heroes, and our men and women in uniform defending our country. Well, let's go back to the prior statement. Reaffirming the importance of religious freedom to our way of life. Well, we know that is one thing that America was born on with that thought upon it, but we also know 
that they had a Christian base of which to have this great idea. Know your history. For goodness sakes, know it upon the principles of what this country was founded upon. It wasn't founded upon Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. We gave them the freedom to practice their religion, but we made God, we made Jesus our priority of our religion. That's why our country was blessed for so long. <clears throat> He will hold a roundtable discussion with the community members. And for years, he's been lobbied. Hey, didn't he campaign and say he was going to do away with all them nasty lobbyists? There were just too many around. Hey, never did. In fact, they increased. Check it out. If you don't believe me. So he got lobbied, probably by the Islamic Society people, to visit this mosque. 29% of Americans and 45% of Republicans think he is Muslim. 29%. Well, that's a close to a third. And they have good reason to believe he is anything but a Christian. And we have the possibility of this that came up a month ago. Presidents rarely visit houses of worship aside from when they have attended church for their own religious practices. Oh, Bummer regularly attends religious services on key holidays. In May, he visited the synagogue for the first time as president. Ask yourself that question. If he has said before that he knows Jesus is Lord and that he says he's a Christian, how come we never had any pictures of him strolling out of the old church on a, you know, a day of worship? How come he doesn't say, yeah, I go once a week, every week? You never hear that, do you? And we go back to Bush. He visited the Islamic Culture Center. Oh. Less than a week after 9-11, we're declared, Islam is peace. The faith of terror is not the true faith of Islam, even though it calls for jihad within it, if you're not Islamic. Oh, all you got to do is look it up and read all the passages and stuff. And you can, if you have any semblance of uh, intellect about you, you'll be able to understand Here's old Teddy Cruz criticizing, using this to try and score some points. When politicians insult the Muslims, whether abroad or right here in America, our fellow citizens, when a mosque is vandalized or a kid bullied, that doesn't make us safer. That's not telling it like it is. It's just wrong. It betrays who we are as a country. Well, this is a pretty long article here. They're really beefing it up for him because they know he's going to catch something out of this from people finding out. President Dan Pfeiffer used to be the senior advisor, and he writes that this will resonate nationwide. He's the most powerful person in the world. His presence sends a very powerful message to the Muslim American community. Yes, he's showing solidarity with them. It's like whenever he was over there and he bowed to the Saudi king. When you hear someone who's lived over there for all that time describing what that 
that simple little act that nobody paid attention to, bowing to that king, when you hear them describe what it means, then you understand what he was doing. Might have been a while since then, but he did it. It had a meaning. Find out what the meaning was. He has visited several mosques overseas. Yes, he has. Oh boy. It would send a big, powerful message about recommitting to religious freedom if we had Bush and Obama visit together. Hey, they didn't like each other, did they? Now they're buddies, you know. It's like wrestlers and pro wrestling. They're enemies on stage, but they're buddies off the camera. It's all a show. You're the audience. They're putting on a play for you. Oh, here is a statement. We have had, we have a seat at the table. That's a level of engagement we haven't seen for some time. The end of the administration is a critical point. We don't know who will replace him. But regardless, we need to be involved. Well, we do know who will replace him, and you know who will replace him. It's going to be somewhat, when you say it can't get any worse, it will. Remember when Bush was in there and he said, all right, can't get any worse. Let's elect this guy that gave this rousing speech. Hey, who is he? Oh, he's a nobody. He's a senator. I ain't heard of him, but it sounds good what his speech said. <clears throat> so they jammed him in there. It done had you brainwashed, so you'd go along with it. He had a chance to figure things out. But apparently, lots of people still haven't figured nothing out. Now we go to this other side of America. We continue to see this. Tolerance, this word, tolerant, to be tolerant and allowing, to go along with, to say it's okay. Here is another moral example that is absolutely disgusting. I've said before, and I've included links, and I'm going to tell you, I believe it's eight, Levit Leviticus 18.22. It can't be any plainer. God does not like, tolerate, there's that word, tolerate, or endorse homosexuality of any kind. No lesbianism, no flat-out homosexuality between males, no transgenderism, no nothing of the sort. But yet, here you go with a religious person who claims to be a priest, preaching the Word of God, who is saying, I am gay. Though so he's outwardly saying no to the very word which he knows is in there and what it says, God finds it detestable. It is abomination. How much more clear can that be? But yet this man, and he's not the only one, there are more, but this is the, the new article that has come out. And it talks about this man coming out finally and admitting 
that he's gay, how he weighs all the factors and everything of his decision, And then it goes on to talk about Francis and the statement that he made a while back about who am I to judge? Well, we are not to judge anyone. What does it say? Maybe the exact words escape me. Something to the effect of uh, judge not lest you be judged in the same way. So this, if you judge someone, whatever criteria you use, that same criteria of judgment that you used on someone will be used on you for, for you being judged. You show someone the error of their ways. You try and correct them. You can't do it on your own. You get one or more other people to go with you. You, you, you try it as a, a small congregation of people. If that doesn't work, <coughs> you've done all you can. You're not judging them. You're explaining to them what they're doing wrong and what the penalty of that wrong is going to be so that they know they will have been told and shown. If they reject it, then they do. It goes on down here. Priests want to be good priests, do their job. More priests are rightfully more concerned about homelessness versus getting caught up in something about sex. We should be more concerned about these issues like homelessness that are impacting people. Well, for me, homelessness, of course, is something that we should try to do, you know, provide for the homeless, the hungry, the needy, the sick, the lonely. everything that Jesus would do, that he's taught us to do. But a homeless person's soul is not going to have jeopardy of ending up in hell just because they're homeless and they're, they're in this problem of homelessness. So to say more priests are rightfully more concerned about homelessness getting, versus getting caught up in something about sex, which is homosexuality, is ludicrous. You're in jeopardy of your soul being judged and, and separated from the kingdom of God forever. Just because you're sleeping in a cardboard box in a ditch or a dumpster or just right there on the sidewalk, that's not going to get you into hell. It's a tough deal, but that's not going to jeopardize your soul. These acts are going to jeopardize your soul. This is a disappointing. Parishioners are very supportive. Religious women were very supportive. One group that was silent were my brother priests. Gay ones as well as straight. So he's telling you there are more. Priest views of the church's handling of homosexuality are not uniform. Some blame Catholicism for the decades it took them to accept themselves. Others credited their training and the help of other priests with their self-knowledge, saying homophobia in the non-church culture is the problem. <clears throat> this is quite a little lengthy article here, too. There's your... Francis is famous, who am I to judge comment.
folks. God knows everything that's going on. He blesses and he takes away blessings. But he does not stop loving. This man here, he loves him just as much as anyone else. But he does not like what he's doing at all. Or what anyone who's doing in the homosexual community wants them to come out of their wicked, sinful way. But they are blind. Their own selfish, lustful desires are blinding them to the reality that God will let them put their own self in hell. That is freedom of choice choose God or not, to try as hard as you can to live by his word or not. You cannot selectively dismiss and omit teachings that you disagree with and then be sinning in those very teachings which say don't do this and expect there to be no judgment for it. This is just another one reminder of how the moral fabric of America has decayed, continues to decay. The decay is endorsed from the highest level. As we remember, we saw the White House shining in the rainbow colors, endorsing that type of sinful conduct. When God looks down, he doesn't see presidents in those times back back then. They were kings, and princes. They were not referred to as presidents and prime ministers, earls, dukes, and such. So when he looks at Obama as the figurehead, leader of our country, he sees a king. So even though we the people can repent of our sins and turn away from this type of conduct, he's also looking for the figurehead. Will the king of this nation turn away? Will this king set an example for the rest to follow? Because typically populations respected their leaders majority wise so if a majority looked at their leader and what he was doing and followed his lead that was either a good or a bad thing in our country it's quite obvious our king has not repented and doesn't intend to <coughs> And a large group of people, populace, is endorsing and following his lead. And their, their children growing up, hitting the teenage years and stuff, and even younger than that, it's in your public school system where they're endorsing this type of a conduct. They're teaching them that it's okay, that, that, it's, that it's your right. It's not a right, it's a choice. Choice to do good or choice to live evil. When you see parents allowing small children, six, seven, eight years old, a girl who thinks she's a boy and wants to be a boy, a boy who thinks he's a girl and wants to be a girl, and they raise them and dress them at that as that. So that by the time they're teenage and then they're grown up, they will be a Bruce Jenner. And what a sad man that is. Deserving of no award. 
And we can only pray for that man's soul. And we're going to hop on over here to this idea of people being chipped. Uh, maybe the mark of the beast would be a chip. I still think it would be more like a nanotech tattoo on your forehead or your skin. But we've seen different instances in the past where people that work in certain buildings and stuff, they get a chip. They can scan their keypad to enter the building with their hands. They don't have to slide a card or punch a keypad or nothing. So this is an article that just came out about a guy that went and got his hand chipped so that he could pass through airports. And he just doesn't have to carry nothing. A smartphone. No boarding pass. He says I carry something that can't run out of batteries because it's not battery powered. It's awakened by the reader when I come close to it and I, I can't lose it. I'm actually carrying the right to travel. He's a frequent flyer on Scandinavian Airlines. He bought a kit online and had the airline encrypt his euro bonus number used to keep track of bookings on what's called a near field communication chip. Then he had a nurse inject it into his hand. He ordered the implant from a Seattle-based website called Dangerous Things. They have a variety of implantable transponders based on the same concept as microchips for pets. Most popular models going for about a hundred bucks. Here he goes. Grafstra has a chip implanted in each hand, using them to do everything from getting into his house to starting his motorcycle. See how they make it like it's so convenient for you? You can do all these things. Why not do it? It eliminates the need for keys. It's incredibly freeing. You feel like you're communicating with machines directly as a human being. You've upgraded yourself. Oh. Grafstra said most of his clients use implants for things like unlocking a house or accessing a computer, although one man put in a chip with an animated GIF that would show up on a phone when scanned, and he called it a digital tattoo. He recommended customers inject themselves. He doesn't recommend that. And the company offers a locator map of professional body piercers who are trained to insert them. And then it goes on in the end to say, the head of digital experience at Scandinavian Airlines said by the telly, they don't have any plans to make chips a regular part of flying. Not, we don't think their customers are ready to do that yet. But the technology is not there, but it's going to be there. I think in five years' time, you probably have a chip in your hand. Really. This guy still has his implant, which is visible beneath his skin when he stretches it. He may try to put different data on it, so it's like his bank pen. It's going to stay for a while until I'm done experimenting, or until the next generation of chip comes around. Mm-hmm. 
That's just another. Hey, look at this. This is so handy. Y'all ought to get one. It's coming. Something is coming. Something big is coming. I guarantee you. It would be a lot easier, though. Like that lady, I think she might have been from Google. I don't remember. I saw a video a few years back. And she was talking about a digital tattoo. And it was on the skin. And she thought that that would be more apt to get the young ones because it would be something really cool you know a lot of people like them tattoos huh so the idea of a tattoo that actually does something besides just being there to look at would probably be something that appeals to those people that like those tattoos Let's see what else we got here. We're going to go into the economy now. <clears throat> Remember last year, I believe the high was right about 18.1. I think we're about 16.4, somewhere around there. We're not quite 2,000 down now, but we're down from the high of last year. We've seen oil fall. A good 70% from what it was selling at. We, where I work at, since our products are manufactured mainly selling in the oil field and gas related services, supplying those areas, we've been on reduced hours for 32 hours a week since May. So when you go fill up that at the pump and you think about how cool it is, it's not costing you that much. Think about how it's costing somebody else a lot more. They, they want you to think that the economy is chugging right along. They want you to think that the unemployment is low. They want you to think all kinds of bullshit. Oh. But the consumer will have more money in their pocket so they can go out and do what with it? Spend it. Buy more crap. Come buy some more crap from our stores. Give the money back to us so that we can become more powerful with wealth. That way, we can control you even more. Because with more wealth comes more power. When you have wealth, money, then you have power. When you have money and power, you have control. That's what George Bush said in an interview while he was running for, going to be running for president for, before he got elected the first term. And those kind of criminals, they know. He flat out told you. He was... I can't find that video anymore. He was in his pickup truck and someone was in the back seat because he had to occasionally turn his, his head around when he answered these questions. And that's what he said back then. So anyway, they want you to buy more crap with the money that you're saving at the pump and say everything's a lovely day. This is all pre-planned. And if you believe those articles that Saudi Arabia is not making any money off this reduced price, you got to be out of your mind. All you have to do is put yourself in the place of the scumbag and ask yourself, am I going to take a loss to drive these people out of business? Or what's the cheapest that I can run things down to to where I'm still making money? I won't make as much as I was before. In the long run, I will, because I will capture the market share of those that I run out of business. And that will mean 
more money in my pocket than before because I will have more market share, more money, more power, more control. And the answer to that question is no. They would not take a loss, and they are not taking a loss. I'm so sick of reading these articles about Saudi Arabia is losing money, driving the price of oil down. They wouldn't have done it if they were losing money. You go on to read this. It's going to tell you about a bunch of things happening. You're going to have a jobs report. It goes on to talk about some stocks. We're going to use all this data. And then they're going to make a little report on everything and see what the Fed's going to do. Will the Fed take any action? Will they raise interest rates? What are they going to do? The central banks, yeah, them central banks have helped lift stocks in the past couple weeks. First, when the European Central Bank said it would consider what? More easing. Yep. Then the Bank of Japan on Friday shocked the market with negative interest rates. Yes, I did say that. And yes, it is in print. And no, they're not the first ones to do it. But you're seeing another country negative interest rates. Yes. <clears throat> the central bankers could certainly be a factor for the markets in the week ahead. Mario Draghi speaking. Going to be speaking too. Bank of Japan, yeah, Kuroda. Friday, the U.S. jobs report could be a big market mover after December's data, surprise to the upside with 292,000 payrolls. The Economist, whoops. What in the world? Oh, like we got a little bunch of stuff flashing here. Anyway, the economists expect 190,000 non-farm payrolls, and there's that unchanged rate of 5%. Right. If you think the unemployment rate is 5%, you definitely have a mental impairment. Because full employment, what they call full employment, is like 4.5%. Eight or something like that. So, what they're telling you is we're at full employment right now. You got to be out of your mind to think that. <clears throat> Refresh this, baby. Bunch of these flash ads are dicking around here. All right, go back to the Michelle Meyer. Warm weather probably led to the creation of more construction jobs than other jobs. Cold weather didn't end the job growth. They're blaming the weather. Uh huh. And there's going to be, she said, continued losses in the mining and energy. That's the field that I work in, energy. Oil prices stayed low for longer than expected. Companies are going to be forced to let go workers they were trying to retain because of cost of firing and rehiring. We let go of um, 12 so far that I know of besides reducing the hours. And I predict there will be more because orders are sporadic, they're not stable and consistent, and when there's no need for your product, there's less sales. 
that's less revenue to pay the bills and the payroll. And a company will do what it needs to do to survive. We have a very unbalanced economy. Service sector, service sector is on solid footing. Construction's okay. Mining, manufacturing, energy in a devastated conditions right now. You think, huh? Oh, concern in the slowdown in corporate profits that could impact the real economy. Fourth quarter earnings expected to be down 4.1, but energy earnings are down about 75%. You think this economy is not in trouble? I've showed you the debt clock before. You can't keep running a debt and survive. Mortimer said there's a greater threat of recession, but he does not expect one. In our base case, recession is avoided. And markets have a decent back half of the year. Huh. We never got out of a recession. How are you out of a recession when all they're doing is printing money and making shit jobs for you? You want to be a maid? You want to be a bartender? You want to be a cashier at Walmart? or Dollar General Store, or McDonald's, crap like that. Eh? How about working at a call center? Something like that. Of course, they would probably call that call center job a job in the technology field, maybe. And so, we're going to have earnings on Monday. These are the places. Tuesday. These are the ones. Vehicle sales. Wednesday, these are the ones. Thursday, these are the ones. Friday, these are the ones. And then you'll see the articles come out. They'll tell you how everything's just fine. Nothing to see here. Go back to sleep. Nothing to see here. This one's about our old buddy George Soros. Yeah, we know about Mr. Soros. If you think Trump's going to win, if you think Bernie's going to win. If you think Teddy Cruz is going to win, you're out of your mind. These people place them in where they want them, when they want them. And they tell you this ahead of, in advance of your vote don't count voting. So you're going to read Soros contributed $6 million to the PAC that supports Clinton. Now he's given a total of seven. And this priorities USA action raised forty one million in twenty fifteen. <clears throat> Mr. Soros is a despicable, dirty criminalistic, manipulator, and if he is involved with this woman, that's only one signal that she's going to win. She's already won eight years ago. She ran against Obama. Anybody remember that little secret meeting they had? Then after it was all said and done, he just barely nudged her out by the hair on his chinny-chin-chin, chin, didn't he? Yeah. 
Well, she got a nice job after that. Yeah, didn't she? In his administration. Yeah. Hey, how about Benghazi, huh? Hmm? She in jail for that yet? No. How about those secret emails? She in jail for that yet? No. You hear all this crap of, oh, that might jeopardize her run at the presidency. She might have to drop out. Are you kidding me? These kind of criminals get away with anything. They're not prosecuted. Look at all the secrets, technology and stuff that her hubby Bill gave to the Chinese when he was in there. You know how much money they probably paid him? To give them that stuff. He's not in jail. And like I said earlier, maybe I didn't expand on it enough. Or at all. I might have got off track. When we had Bush in there, people said, It can't get any worse. Let's try this guy. <laughs> and they led you to the poll knowing beforehand that that's who they were going to put in. You were just manipulated into raising such a ruckus about it. Well, it did get worse after Bush, didn't it? This guy said he would get rid of the debt, didn't he? Nope, he hadn't. He's doubled it. Yep. Said he'd get rid of the lobbyists, didn't he? Yep, he didn't. He got more. Yep, he said he'd do away with this war and that war. He didn't. Nope, we're still over there. And it is worse. So when you say, well, it can't get worse than Obama, it will. Because that is the plan. They are proceeding with the plan. And each time they put a successor in, Things get worse for us. Not for them. For us. We are the serfs. We are the cattle. They are the elite. We are not worthy. They are the worthy to lead. To lead us down the pathway of crap. Their evil master is who they take the orders from. That's why they are in the positions that they are in. Do you think that God thinks that this evil woman here should be our leader? If he were to, if he were to give you a yes or no, and you could ask him that question, based upon the things this woman has done. That we know she's done. That she gives false and misleading statements about these things and never admits to her actual criminality within these events. And I think if you could ask him that, he'd say, no, I don't endorse her. But we can't. But we have to pray for our leaders. Just like anybody else, he loves this woman just as much as you or I. But he wants the people like this to stop doing their evil and get away from it. But they are saying no, and they're not doing it. And so for some of these reasons, it's why our nation is being judged. It's why it's falling apart. Now we will discuss this. Could this be Planet X? Could this be Nibiru? Could this be Wormwood? They have good evidence for Planet X. 
They're the ones that said this. It's thought to be as big as Neptune. It is saying it's a long ways away. They are giving you 10 to 20,000 years to make a circle around the sun. More than 150 years for the first time, good evidence of planetary census of the solar system is incomplete. They base their findings on six objects in the icy Kuiper belt, here to be influenced by only one thing, a real planet. Now, <clears throat> this is not new news, folks. It's been around for a while. Something was perturbing the other planets. Something was perturbing the other planets. And everybody said, Hi, oh, you, you guys are nuts. Eh, it's all pie in the sky. No. I don't know if their figures are correct or not, but they're telling you, without saying it, that there is something there. We found a gravitational figure of this planet lurking on the outskirts of the solar system. But they say they haven't fi found the object itself. Adding the actual discovery when it when it happens, so they're they're telling you it's gonna happen. They're not saying I don't think we'll find it. They're, they're, it's gonna be era defining. We have felt great disturbance in the force. It has an egg-shaped orbit, which you could probably describe as elliptical. Backyard telescopes may spot it if the planet is relatively closer to us and swing around the sun. They prefer to call it Planet 9 versus the historical term Planet X. Ten times more massive than Earth. The evidence for the first time is actually very good that this thing is actually out there. Okay. So, I have read it. When you think about the ancients, there is also something called the Colbrun. They call it the Colbrun Bible. When I read that story of the, the devastating destruction that occurred, I do not believe that these people cooked this story up so that all these years later, future mankind would read this and they could laugh at us because they faked this out. They're describing something above their heads that they can see in the sky. Whatever it was, at least when they saw it then, it did not bring good things with it. It brought death and death, destruction, total devastation. <clears throat> now, I've said it before, I'll continue to say that, Sitchin did quite a bit of work on those clay tablets. Now, he may not have got everything 100% right, but I believe he got a lot of stuff right. 
totally defining when something is coming back from when it has been before. That's got to be one of the hardest things that you could possibly ever try to do. So no matter who it is that's trying to pinpoint a date, a year, what have you, when this thing will come around, that's got to be astronomically hard to do. So Sitchin said 3,600 years. These people think 10 to 20,000 years. There's quite a bit of a gap there, right? And then we have the um, Gilbersard, which he's done quite a bit of work into this, and he is He's made a fine presentation and a fine argument for biblical happenings that could possibly relate to this object, this, this planet, whatever it actually is. And he likens it to being 360 years, which would put it very soon in our, in our time ahead. So we have timelines all over the place. But what we appear to have is, is records that indicate something was around back then. And it didn't seem to ever bring anything good with it. It brought a punishment to the planet and, the, and those that are on it, it appears. I don't think they'll ever give us a straight answer and the truth on this. What I can say, Jesus is coming back, and it's not 50 years from now or 100 years from now. Could you imagine this place 50 or 100 years from now with the way things are changing and what they're changing into? I can't see it. Things just can't last this way for that long. So if you don't have him in your life, you don't have anything at all. You don't really have a life. He loves forgiven. And he'll never stop forgiven. If you truly mean it and ask to have all the wrong things you've done, thought, said, forgiven, he will. But in return, you need to show a commitment. You need to show appreciation and love. You need to stop doing them. Nobody can completely stop sinning 100%. But the level of the evil of the sin that you might commit when you're really, really trying Might be a lot less. So you need to put the armor of God on. You need the helmet. You need the shield. You need the sword. You need everything. When you when you when you're going into battle, I mean, think about it. Think about it. You know this the similarity of it. Back in those times when they went into battle, the soldiers put their armor on, didn't they? Yeah, they got armored up because they were going to go fight. And that's what he's asking you to do. Put on the spiritual armor that he gives you. 
it is mostly, not all, your fight is spiritual. You can't see him, but evil spirits are all around us all the time. It's not just your brain thinking these things that you could do wrong, that you think wrong. If you thought it wrong, you did it. Maybe you say, well, I just thought it, I didn't do it, so that's nothing. No, you thought it. So you got to get rid of bad thoughts, too. <coughs> that's those little evil spirits tempting you. That's why you think them things. They have the ability to, to do these kind of temptations somehow, supernaturally unbeknownst to us, but when we become aware of it, then we can fight it. When you do these things, and you start to realize and be able to control your thoughts more before they turn into words that you speak or actions that you act out and actually do. When that happens, you'll catch yourself real quick you'll realize I shouldn't have thought that. And when you do that, and you're really trying, and you mean it, you want to show him, you'll immediately think it in your head, if not speak it out loud, that you're sorry that you thought that. And you'll ask to be forgiven. These things will come more and more and more and more often, because you, you have, you'll have the Holy Spirit inside of you. The Holy Spirit convicts you it's like it's like a conscience you know it'll it'll make you feel bad about what you've done sometimes you know a lot of times and and that's a good thing it's a good thing to feel bad about wrong things that you've done if you never felt bad about any wrong thing that you did you keep doing them because there's nothing it's not nothing wrong to you There's some things left that's going to happen before Christ comes back. Now, I've been bothered by that little Jewish boy that made that video about he had an out-of-body experience, near-death experience, and saw heaven and everything, and was shown some things. I've been having a real hard time with what he said. Now a lot of what he said, I was, you know, I was, a, I, I was listening with an open ear, an open mind. But when he got to the part where he said, Messiah was already here, but hadn't revealed itself and that people were going to be surprised at who he was when he finally revealed himself. That's the part that I, I, I'm troubled by. Of, of, and I can't get past it because we know when Jesus comes back he comes on a cloud with 10,000 of his saints. He will come back from above our head. We will look up and see into the sky. That is where he will come back, from above our head. He won't come back, be hidden among us, not nobody knowing he's here, and then bang, he says, I'm here. That's not how he said it. He told you, if somebody says, I'm over here, I'm over there, hey, look, I'm over here, I'm out in the wilderness, I'm in the desert and stuff, I'm all over the place, don't believe it. That's what he said. So this statement that the child made, the teenage boy, it makes me think of Antichrist. 
the man of sin, the son of perdition, the lawless one. Because it says he, he will be revealed at some point, which means he's already here. You just don't know who he is yet. So I am bothered by that part of what that boy said because the boy made no mention of Jesus coming from the clouds on a cloud with 10,000 of his saints. Not, not that I can remember. I watched it. <clears throat> I watched two different ones. He's got a, uh, a different one than the original one. I saw that the other day. So don't be deceived. He said that, let no man deceive you. Make an effort, and he knows you've made the effort. Turn away from the nasty stuff that you're doing. It's the only chance that sinners have, is to turn away. You can't keep doing the same sins over and over and over again and asking forgiveness. You have to repent of them. You have to try and stop. He knows your heart. He knows if you're trying or not. You're not going to sit there and say, I tried, I just couldn't do it. He, he, know, he knows your heart. And that goes for the weed smokers. All these weeders that say, oh, it's got medicinal properties in it. Yeah, well, smoking cigarettes is bad enough, and I'll admit that I smoke cigarettes. And I, I'm, I'm going to make a, an effort to stop those, because if the body is your temple, and your temple should be a holy vessel. So if your temple is to be a holy vessel, then you can't put nasty crap inside of it. So for a weeder to say, eh, it's not hurting nothing. Like I said, he knows your heart. He knows that you know whether you say there's nothing wrong with it and you're going to hurt nothing, he knows that you know you shouldn't be doing it. That little piece stuck in your mind and in your heart that knows you shouldn't be doing it because he don't like it, that's coming out when you're in front of the throne. You're not going to hide that. You're not going to hide that little part that you always knew that he didn't like it and he wouldn't approve of. And if you hadn't asked to be forgave for it, guess what? There's some kind of something written in that book about that sin. You'll have that wrote down there as a sin. So what's a punishment for sin? Now's the time for forgiveness, not when you're being judged. <clears throat> so get ready, people. The rest of 2016 is going to be one hell of a hard ride. You can make a book on that. This Ponzi scheme, this thing they call the world economy, this thing they call the new world order, it's all coming online this year. Will the man of sin be revealed? This year? I'm not quite sure on that one. I don't think it's going to be this year. I think it's going to, this year is going to be like, guess who's coming to dinner and our special guest of honor is going to be blank. But I think next year, I 
I think 2017, whoever this guy is, he's going to make his presence known. He ain't coming out and saying, hey, I'm the Antichrist. No, it's not going to happen that way. Not in the beginning. Well, I'm sorry that I have to bring the the doom and gloom so hardcore, but you're going to have to persevere because it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. The devil doesn't make things better. The devil makes things worse. In his world, pain is pleasure. Pleasure is pain. He is the opposite of anything good. So he, can, he cannot, by proxy to his mantra, improve anything. He's going to make things worse, which is his way of making things better, because worse is better to him. The good news is our Messiah has already defeated him by shedding his blood on that cross and making a way for our sin to be forgiven so that we could have a way to enter into the kingdom. So it's a decision that you can make or not. I'm trying to light a flame inside of all you people so that you make a decision today. Don't put it off till tomorrow. There may not be a tomorrow for all we know. Pray for everyone. Our leaders all over the world and in our country, the sick, the homeless, the lonely, the dying, Every soul is precious to our Lord. He loves every single person. Even the Hindus, the Buddhists, the, the Muslims, every person. But he wants all people to come to him. To come out of what they're into and find him. That's what this time of your life is basically all four, because if you never found him in your life, if you didn't have him in your life, then you haven't really had a life. So we have to pray for all those different cultures who worship those other false gods to come out of what they're into and accept Jesus as their Lord. And if we do that, it's a good thing in the eyes of the Lord that we do that for them. They may not come out of what they're into, but they will have been prayed for. And the power of prayer is a powerful thing. I, don't, I can't even describe the power of it. It's so powerful. <clears throat> well, this has been an extraordinarily long video, but I had a lot to speak, many subjects to cover, and there will be more. But you watch that financial report this week, and you watch what they're going to say after they get this report, and you think about what they said, does if what they say actually match up with what you know, with what you see, with what you feel. That's just some tips I can give you. The rest is up to you. So y'all be good. I'll speak to you soon. 
I'll be looking for some more stuff about this Planet 9. I don't think they're going to dish out too much more about it, though. We'll see where they're going to go and what they're going to say after this. I'm going to leave it with this. This is what these people tell you now. They claim, I think they claim they're going to go for the old Subaru telescope. Try and, try and do some looking at the Subaru. Well, why does the Vatican have a telescope named Lucifer? What are they looking at, huh? Why does a soul-saving entity like the Catholic Church have a super telescope that they call the Lucifer to be peering into the heavens? Why are they doing that? What are they looking for? Or what are they watching that they have already found? Think about it.